If no questions, then it means that you didn't hear me, okay? So, no, this thing doesn't work. Right, this thing doesn't work, so I will have to use something else. Okay, uh, my name is Anton, and uh, I'm a big fan of open source. I'm a big fan of, oh yeah, actually, good idea. <laughs> you see, we fix printers, we fix sliders, what else should we fix? Excellent. So, still, my name is An Anton Babenka, and uh, I'm not uh, from warm place as previous speaker, so I get used to snow. I live in Norway for the last 13 years, and uh, uh, less than that, I try to stay active with open source and uh, for the last three years I'm actively contributing and uh, having fun with Terraform, AWS, organizing different uh, events like DevOps Days in Oslo, different user groups, travel around and uh, try to make people aware about these technologies and how to use them properly. So uh, uh, some of you are probably familiar with Terraform, so I just would like to hear uh, faces and hands who know what is Terraform and who use it daily, right? Okay, good, so it's about half of people. Uh, and I think uh, some of you actually use code which uh, I wrote or which I contribute to or which I maintain for the, for the last uh, three years. Uh, uh, Terraform AWS module is one of the most uh, popular one which was downloaded uh, two millions of times and uh, for the last year and uh, a few other projects related to Terraform. Uh, I, I actively uh, uh, stay in the community and listen in what kind of questions people constantly ask me, like how to structure my projects, how to solve this thing, how to do that better, and so on. So uh, three months ago, I started writing Terraform best practices, and uh, it has not been finished yet because things are constantly, constantly changing, and I have to earn money, and I have to uh, I find some customers. I'm not employed by HashiCorp, as you may think, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I write a lot about different things. So if you have questions after this talk or about Terraform, feel free to find me by my nickname. Uh, this nickname is everywhere. And if you are thinking, what is this module CF? Yes, I have logo for this as well, and I have stickers. So uh, more about this later. Terraform AWS modules uh, is uh, the project which is a collection of uh, reusable components for traditional things like VPC, security groups, RDS, and uh, many, many more. Uh, it started uh, um, more than a year ago, but uh, a year ago uh, as, w uh, as well as uh, release of Terraform registry. Uh, this became uh, verified and now they are used by lots of lots of different people. So why Terraform? Right. This talk is about Terraform and something about it. So Terraform was uh, created uh, in about 2014, right? And uh, the only purpose of it was uh, to be able to write, plan, and manage infrastructure as code. Uh, this talk is uh, maybe a little bit more advanced and I assume that you know a lot of these things already, so I will not go in details and I expect you to actually read documentation uh, in addition to this talk. Uh, documentation is excellent. so. Nevertheless, right, so it works almost. Uh, so this is how a main TF file looks in Terraform. You describe some variables, you describe some resources, you uh, have uh, some, um, some dependencies between different resources. And uh, as you, yeah, it's bad, as bad as you can guess. So uh, you, you define some uh, information about AWS region where infrastructure is going to be created. You define what kind of resources like S3 bucket or uh, which will be created. You run some commands. Uh, yeah, that's life. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but that's that's how it is. Um, unfortunately, the projector is not so great, but yeah, I can read what is on the slide. So you run command terraform ini to download dependencies, and uh, after that you run command to uh, to create these resources uh, like terraform apply, and it will show you what exactly is going to be created, and you confirm it, and then you have these resources created. 
right? So now slide on white background illustrate uh, that different cloud providers over time come up with different solutions to Terraform, like before Terraform. For example, AWS CloudFormation was created by AWS uh, with similar purpose. Google Cloud has come up with its own solution to deploy resources and Azure eventually came up with something similar. But you may think why Terraform existed in first place, right? The, the main reason why Terraform exists is that there are much more than uh, this. There are more than 100 different providers which allows to configure different resources on different systems. Uh, and this is one of the biggest sales points of why people should use Terraform versus uh, whether I have to stick with CloudFormation if I'm not gonna to leave uh, AWS. No, you should not use CloudFormation. So uh, Terraform is universal tool for everything where we have an API. An API, believe it or not, exists even for Dropbox files. Even Jira issue can be created with uh, Terraform. Uh, there are many different use cases when you want to be able to configure your resources like uh, Datadog uh, metrics or uh, uh, control permissions to different objects. So everything what is uh, available through API can be controlled using Terraform. So now let's begin with uh, more or less real projects where at the beginning everything was fine, everything fit into single main TF file and it was just fine, right? So we have, oh my God. Oh, I cannot rely on this, sorry, but it's, uh, That's a good idea. <laughs> I see so many geeks in the room, we fixed. <laughs> Excellent. But we have not fixed the clicker yet. So I will stay here, no problem. So uh, on this slide we see uh, how Terraform configuration looks when we just need to create a basic uh, virtual private cloud uh, within AWS. So it's simple, nothing special. But eventually your project will grow and you add different things into it. Right? You may think what exactly you're going to add and you are going to add resources, regions, providers, whatever else you can figure out. You will integrate everything with everything. So it should remind you that you will continue editing main TF file and now you just add the internet gateway, right? Because you want to access internet. Good idea. Then a little bit later you figure out that you need some subnets and then you probably need something else. So you will add a lot of different uh, things and by the time when you figure out that you actually need to access uh, internet from private subnets, you need to configure routes and routing table and all of this uh, together, uh, your network uh, configuration in Terraform will end up in about 300 lines at least. It can be much more. So you may think what exactly is going on with main tier. Of course it's growing. And it's growing uh, approximately 10, 20 kilobytes for just networking stack with more than 300 lines of code. And uh, dependencies eventually will get worse and worse. That's natural solution why we're here is a Terraform come up with Terraform modules. So Terraform modules is just a Excellent. I don't know why it's, oh yeah, now you can see it. Magic. So, yeah, actually uh, speaking about modules, Magic Modules is a resort name by Google. Uh, you can Google it. So, okay, yeah, I think so, I'm so messed up. Right, so modules, uh, it's really important to understand from uh, Terraform documentation are just self-contained packages of Terraform configurations uh, that are managed as a group. That's the only thing which you have to understand about modules uh, from Terraform documentation. Uh, there are several types of modules, like the first one, which is the, the easiest one and more uh, very reusable one because it's possible to open source and it's hard to invent something there. It is a resource module where just the resources can be created in different configuration, nothing else uh, there. As in this example, there is a, a way of using security group module of, uh, which is hosted on uh, Terraform registry 
uh, we specify that we need to use version 2.0.0 and we provide a bunch of uh, uh, arguments to this module. So that's all what we have. Uh, we, we have information, uh, yeah, you may think uh, what exactly the purpose of resource module and the main answer is that uh, such resource modules can be versioned while individual resource block cannot be versioned. But if this is not convincing, then think about security group module and this is real uh, code within this security group module. It is, creating, it is creation of EC2 uh, security group module in different, different configuration. Believe me, you don't want to write this code uh, for your project because I hope this is not your business, right? I mean, you probably don't earn on creation uh, code in Terraform and selling it, for security group at least. So the code itself uh, is about 600 lines uh, and it can be a very powerful way of abstraction. Uh, next slide. Uh, second type of module is infrastructure module, which is just a uh, high, uh, high level because it consists of uh, resource modules and it often enforces something what is related for the company like tagging, naming, and so on. And that's exactly where, where it makes sense to reuse uh, existing tools like JSONnet or cookie cutter or different preprocessor, make file, whatever else to fulfill missing bits of Terraform 011. And infrastructure module uh, invocation looks pretty similar. So we have uh, module hosted on the registry and we specify a bunch of different uh, values which we pass as arguments to the module. Inside of this module, we are just invoking resource module for VPC, application load balancer, and many other things. So just to summarize, uh, there are two types of module, resource and infrastructure, and resource is very reusable one. So let's look into how to write modules. So the first tip which I'd like to give is to not write uh, resource module, but just check what is existing there. Uh, there are more than 600 modules published in the registry. M many of them are very good quality, so don't be creative unless you really need. Sorry, keep on. So if you actually decide to write some modules, then try to hide all this complexity, as I showed for security group, somewhere inside of this module. Uh, as in this example, um, people who are using the module, they don't really know difference between implementation of time zone in MSSQL versus MySQL. So they're just calling this module. And then inside of the module, we're using, uh, we're creating uh, resource based on uh, certain criteria. Like in this case, if name was SQL Server, then create uh, MSSQL. Uh, otherwise create uh, MySQL and use time zone only for MSSQL. As an output of the module, we are outputting uh, the only result which is available there. So user doesn't have to know that we are actually creating one type of database or another. It's different implementation details are totally hidden. Second thing is size of the infrastructure modules. If you think that uh, uh, it's okay to just host all of your infrastructure modules in repository and just uh, use part of it, it's often uh, gonna to be cloned every time when you are invoking all of this. So your module uh, will be just several kilobytes of code while the whole, uh, the whole repository is several megabytes. Then you will have to clone every time the whole repository, which is just inefficient, especially if you're making lots of small resources like IAM users. Uh, MBT is a good solution to split uh, one one big Git repository into several, and you can do this uh, on build process. A few things which uh, I'd like to point, uh, which you have to avoid. So first of all, uh, is uh, never use providers in modules. And uh, the only exception is that you may use logical providers like template, random, local, HTTP, external, but not in uh, cloud providers or any other state providers. Uh, you may think why it's actually bad because I did this and it works. Yes, exactly, it works for you, but it will not work for Petya or Vasa. Because uh, the way how Terraform is invoking provider's configuration uh, is not possible to override. 
So if you put this code inside your module and you want, uh, and you ask why people are not using my module, that's because of this, uh, partially. Um, another thing is that provisioners itself are pretty, pretty bad idea to use in all resources. Uh, I know that a lot of people are using them, but I just try to show why this is bad, okay? Uh, even if you are thinking that um, what, what can go wrong here, or I'm just going to use it in EC2 resources because it makes sense. Like my instance is created, then I'm calling Ansible playbook, which will just connect to this IP address. Yes, it's probably fine for some time. And what can possibly go wrong? So the good uh, solution here is that if you can use uh, things like user data on AWS instances, then use that one. If you can use uh, auto scaling group, then use that one as well. Uh, the benefit here is that if you start using uh, provisioners, you will have very hard time migrated uh, into other project or into other, uh, yeah, into just other uh, project or if you want to distribute it somehow. So the way when you actually, uh, you say that no, I absolutely must use my local dependencies and I want to use it, uh, to use my local machine when something is created. Then use null resource for that. Null resource doesn't create any physical resources. So that's exactly the place where such things can be implemented. And a uh, few traits about good Terraform modules. <coughs> I was uh, working with uh, Terraform modules for a pretty long time and then I discovered that it actually makes sense to uh, look around and think what are common mistakes which people are making and why they're actually mistakes. And I ordered this in the, the order of importance. The first, the most important thing in Terraform module is documentation as exa and example. And the least important thing is actually test. If you disagree with me, you're welcome to B or F, which will be tomorrow, uh, slide later. Uh, feature reach is important feature of, um, of good Terraform module because uh, it means that uh, I can use your module and use it for my subset of things and someone else can use and everything should be fine. So that's really uh, one, of the, uh, one of the core feature because some people think that it works for me, I don't care, I will not improve it, that's fine. But if you want it to be actually good and reusable, then it has to cover as much as possible different situations. And never hard code values like uh, uh, some, some things which are related to just your company or your project, things like environment name or company name or, or so, even tags. Everything should, should, should be customized uh, or at least overridden. And uh, make sure that your code is actually readable even by you after a couple months. It's a good suggestion because believe me, you will, you will be using git blame to figure out that, that you wrote this code. Okay, so let's, uh, I don't know, someone said that I have very few minutes left, but I think I have plenty of time. Uh, so yeah, uh, just to summarize, uh, we looked into how to write modules. So first of all, check out registry.terraform.io and find something there. It's, it's likely to be excellent starting point, at least if you're not gonna to use it entirely. And uh, avoid things like providers and provisioners at all in modules use it somewhere else outside. Um, let's look how to call modules. Okay, as we understand the amount of uh, resources uh, still keeps growing. We figure out that we just uh, made our module, we put something there, we somehow have to orchestrate this invocation, we somehow have to call one module and pass dependency to another one, and so on. So let's look into different patterns here. So the first pattern is uh, all in ones where you have to declare variables and outputs in fewer places, but uh, the blast radius is pretty big. Uh, you may use some things like uh, minus target as an argument and specify that you just want to take care of this specific subset of resources. It will work for some time, but uh, it's not the ideal. And uh, everything is blocked at once means that uh, if I'd like to cooperate with uh, some of my colleagues on this project, uh, when they run it, I cannot run it. I cannot run plan or cannot apply it. I will have to wait. And if we are talking about 
uh, resources like CloudFront or if we're talking about Azure provider, things can take minutes, sometimes hours. So this can be very strange that you have to wait in 2019. So uh, another pattern is uh, one in one where things are getting much more isolated and uh, it is possible to work uh, in an isolated set where we have different responsibilities. For example, if we're working with VPC, it's unlikely that we're gonna have to change VPC every day. But it's probably a, a good idea that we, uh, or it's, go it's gonna to be quite possible that we're gonna have to work with application uh, configuration code quite often because we will use GitOps and we'll change all of our uh, TFRs file uh, from CI server. So then it's a good idea to separate and make much smaller uh, BLAST traders. But uh, the only downside here, as I understand, is that we have to copy paste a lot of variables and outputs if we want to use this uh, pattern. So now let's, uh, I don't see so many hands obviously, but uh, the question is uh, what kind of ways do you prefer? Where things are organized like this? Can you raise your hands? Okay, I, at least one I see. No, two, okay. Yeah, but uh, not so many. Okay, let's, uh, uh, who's using this pattern, one and one? Right, so much, much more. I can see this even now. That's, that's really good. So, um, there are a few people raised hands uh, all in one, but a uh, significant amount of people raised one in one. Okay. So, and MFA is most frequent answer, actually is somewhere in between. Because it's very often when you start using something, you're not thinking like, oh my God, this is gonna to be my ideal project, I will make everything correct from first day, right? It's, it's just not gonna happen. So it makes perfect sense uh, to start with something small, and then iterate there, and then when you figure out that now I have, I start to have some mass, then it's time to top of it, right? So how I can actually invoke different uh, modules, what can I do from there? And the question is, uh, what kind of orchestration tools do you use? I can give you a hint that you can use uh, minus target, Terraform apply minus target, and then specify some module or you can use make file to chain different invocation of Terraform init, apply, init, apply, outputs, and many different crazy things. What, what exactly uh, are you using? Like, uh, just r randomly. Who's using uh, things like target or make file and happy with it? Right, so it's pretty funny that I have so many questions and I don't see answers. But uh, I guess it's five, 10 people. Okay, so I have some good, uh, good news for you. You can use Terraform for that as well, right? You can use new resource to invoke Terraform from Terraform, isn't it cool? No? <laughs> Just don't do this, okay? There are better solutions for versioning, but uh, calling Terraform from Terraform uh, is, is doable, I did it, uh, but uh, I did it just for fun to figure out that you have to treat Terraform a little bit differently. Uh, it's, not, it's not made for that, okay? Terraform was designed to run just things linearly, where you change file, you run plan, you run apply, you see output, and you can continue running the same things to verify that the infrastructure has not changed. But if you're actually thinking about orchestration in Terraform, the, the best tool out there right now is Terragrant. Terragrant is tool, is open source, it's written by grant work uh, people and uh, lots of users worldwide uh, are using it uh, to exactly invoke and chain different invocation uh, of uh, infrastructure modules. So how it looks, the Terraform uh, TF VARS file has configuration block where it's specifying where and also what kind of dependencies this module has. In this example, we are calling EC2 instance module, 
which means that network stack has to be dependencies. And uh, also, we just specify what uh, and that's it. Uh, so the whole uh, concept of network stack is abstracted because it's hidden within this formula, which we just developed. It's pretty good. You would think, like, yeah, but TMRs can contain dynamic variants, and who actually have this need? Who doesn't like to hardcore variants of subnet in one place? And some of you may have this need, yes, this is some of this. So Telephone cannot contain dynamic values, so I fixed it. The way how I fixed it is I wrote short script for that. So that's the only thing which uh, is, it was very easy to, uh, to make it, uh, and it works quite nicely, because everyone uh, has configuration log like hooks before hook and after hook. So before running plan or apply, uh, I just run the script to make sure that I actually <coughs> fetch information about subnet, BBCA, or a bunch of other things which go through this uh, combined and uh, put it into a TFR's part. If you want, you can use the for that. Um, right, so we just went into how to call modules. And now let's look into how to actually write uh, or how to work with code. If we have new features into our uh, telephone configuration, usually it's easy. It's really nothing to do with the tell here. But uh, what if we want to use existing infrastructure resources like VPC? Because we started with one big uh, main TF file, we added a bunch of things there, we created VPC there, and then we discovered that, oh no, now I have to use this VPC as an argument to another module, or uh, somehow connect this, or somehow separate the whole thing. Uh, the pattern here is that we use data source and we use resource together. Data source will pick up uh, if uh, ID was present, and the resource will be created if it is not present. And again, the output of these values will be the first not empty value uh, which is there. So, if we're working with list, the problem with Telephone 011 is that uh, list in Telephone have orders, which means that uh, if we are having list of uh, IM users, user one, two, three, four, and then we want to remove user two, uh, then it means that user three and four will have to be recreated because their IDs or their placements have changed. Uh, for, s for some resources, it's totally fine. But what if we actually create IAM users which are, uh, and IAM access keys which are stateful? I mean, when someone uh, whose name is after my name leaving the company, or before, before my leaving the company, I don't want to have new IAM access uh, secret key generated for me. Right? It will be very strange when person with last name starting with Z will have new IAM key every day. That's not going to help people. So the solution here is that if you need to work with stateful list, you may use tools like JSONnet. JSONnet uh, is open source and uh, it's available as CLI, where template for, for it looks like this, where you configure, uh, where you configure, no, this is actually not, not template, this is an output. This is template, oh my God. So the template here is uh, uh, written in JSONnet format. <coughs> and as we probably know, JSON and HTML are compatible, we can use JSON file as well as HTML and Terraform will recognize them. That's why generating of JSON is usually easier than generating of uh, H HTML. So if, if we run commands like this, uh, then the output will be a collection of modules for each individual user. And uh, if we run Terraform init and apply, it will just take care of these users. It will not remove anyone from uh, anyone in the list who's after us. Another uh, thing is related to integration. It may think that uh, Terraform has
has ever somewhat removed, but there is no way to do, let's say, specific features, because Terraform is not always up to date with recent announcement by AWS. And if AWS announced something, it's, it's likely that it will be supported in near future, but probably not right now. So there is still need to use some things like AWS CLI, where we can just use output from one common, uh, from one resource and uh, execute it in cell. If we need to use uh, auto integration, then we again may use null resource uh, for that. There are a bunch of bunch of edge cases, uh, which I'd like to talk tomorrow uh, during BOF about infrastructure testing, but just a small subset of these problems uh, and edge cases is that different AWS regions as well as different AWS accounts have different things like version of F3 signature, whether EC2 classic link was, ena was enabled in this account before or in this region before, uh, whether IPv6 is available here or maybe it's, it's not gonna to be available or maybe IPv6 was there all the time. All of this will uh, have different effects in how you write Terraform. So be very careful and uh, think carefully uh, where this specific code will be executed. And also, uh, uh, what is the soft limit of uh, resources in AWS? Like you may think that it works in dev environment because uh, I'm using something very small, but it will break in production because you have limited amount of uh, IP addresses, for example. So just be careful about that. And there are a bunch of things which I'd like to mention related to, to if you are willing to use Terraform in a way that uh, you remember the command which you wrote last time when you worked on this project, then the best command is actually no arguments at all. So that you run just Terraform apply or just Terraform init and don't specify any arguments, uh, especially if it is not secret. I mean, if it is uh, not secret, then you put it into TFR spy. If it is secret, then you use it as an environment variable and uh, it will be loaded uh, or picked up by Terraform. But uh, it's pretty bad idea to remember that you have to run Terraform apply and then specify two uh, variables and remember order of var files which you have to write. I it is very easy to break and you will just uh, make problems for yourself pretty soon. And also you think that uh, using target and curly list is a good idea because I have big uh, infrastructure and I just want to work on this specific uh, area and it works very fast so I will just keep running with minus target and don't care about the rest. It will be probably fine for some time or for really small edge cases but if you are if you keep doing the same things over and over, you will simply uh, not be able to answer question, uh, what kind of configurations I have on this environment or in production or in dev. Because you always use target, so you didn't run it for everything. And Terraform workspace is evil for majority of cases. I've been in this discussion many times and I'm glad that Terraform documentation was updated not very long time ago uh, where they actually explained quite nicely why and what exactly workspaces were designed for. Because uh, there was huge amount of confusion where people thought that uh, I can just use workspaces for dev staging code and everything will be fine. No, it's not gonna to be fine. And uh, the reason why it's not gonna to be fine is that uh, very soon you will have differences between your environments and something will not be as equal in dev while it should be equal and huge amount of uh, complications you're just bringing to yourself. As well as dependency hell in modules. Terraform does not have a good pattern of using uh, or specifying dependencies between modules so there is no magical requirement PHP or package JSON or whatever else we get used to in other languages. Uh, there are some attempts by community uh, to write a Terra file 
where modules will be configured in one place and we can sync them together, but it's, uh, it's good just for the Firefly fly one. Uh, don't try to use module in module in module in module simply because your file system supports some limits. Right? It's, it's not a good idea. It's just one or two levels maximum is enough. So for, for the time, what I... Well, uh, as, a, as another type of summary, uh, I'd like to highlight that uh, I think the best thing which, or the best advice which I can give is to pursue Terraform easy. Even if it has to ally a pool of 20 or 30 different arguments and uh, you think that you will need all of them at once, try to not use all of them. And you may think why it is so, because I mean, somebody wrote them, so I have to use it. And if you're even curious, why it says for the future in the title, right? Because there will be zero, well, eventually. There are some uh, core contributors uh, to Terraform in this room, somewhere there. Uh, so you may ask questions uh, later and they will be able to answer it, I hope. But the point of uh, 012 is that you may think, uh, you, may, you may be very excited that HCL2, well, simplified syntax. Cool, so I have to, I have to start using 012. Loops are gonna have to be there, so I can use all countless for loop for each for dynamic blocks. And finally, left and right part will not be executed simultaneously in conditionals, and I can use conditional uh, operations properly, and many, many other things which you think you need. Uh, but this was pretty good blog post uh, written a long time ago. But uh, what I just try to figure out from the community is that a lot of people think that 012 is what they need. Just uh, because uh, I have these problems with my code for some time, and 012 has all of these features, so I will just start using it, and it will somehow make my code easy. I personally don't think that it matters so much. 011 uh, had lots of things which uh, people were happy with, we created lots of things uh, using it, it was fine. But uh, with the amount of features which uh, 012 is bringing to developers, I'm afraid that uh, a lot of developers will try to use uh, much more of these features in Terraform code, and it will be just uh, very easier for them to make another sort of spaghetti code. The way how Terraform 012 has to be used and where it's particularly beneficial is just for writing Terraform modules itself. So that when you are uh, thinking about, I need to make a module for S3 bucket. By the way, this is one of the modules which I couldn't write for the last two years because there are 225 permutations, and I don't want to make 225 uh, modules. So uh, if I'm using uh, 012 in order to use dynamic blocks and for loops and so on inside of module, then it's great. But I don't want developers to fall in love with HCL, with easy syntaxes, and they say that, oh my God, JSON is bad, but HCL is excellent. And now I have to tell them that Oh, by the way, you can use loops, and don't, remem don't forget that you can use this and this and this. It will be just uh, another level of complexity for them. If, if you really like 012, then put all of your knowledge into writing modules and not, uh, not uh, let your developers who are just starting, especially Terraform learning, uh, be overwhelmed with the amount of features. And uh, I really encourage to use existing modules and utilities uh, provided by the community. Uh, I'm sure there are some people in this room who, who wrote some utilities. Uh, so thanks personally for all of you because I use a lot of those tools. I have some bonus. This one. Now I can see who was sleeping. <laughs> right. So not many were sleeping, so that's good. So. Uh, some of you may saw this uh, before. So this is the tool called CloudPath, where you can uh, visualize your diagrams uh, of your AWS infrastructure, and you connect different boxes together, you can think about what kind of 
properties or attributes all of this has to have. And uh, about a year ago, I was uh, thinking like, yeah, but uh, we have Terraform, right? We have infrastructure as code. We have uh, AWS console, which people should never have access to because there is code already for why you should be able to even manage something there. So it's kind of uh, not exactly the, the point. Uh, and a year ago, I was uh, thinking like, it would be probably a good idea to make uh, generation from this visual diagram from CloudQuest into uh, Terraform AWS modules. Uh, so using uh, Terraform AWS modules as building blocks for AWS infrastructure and use Terraform as a tool to actually call all of this. So that's why approximately two months ago or so I open sourced uh, this and uh, it is infrastructure as code generator which gets your visual diagrams which your cloud architects love and draw and uh, give you some information as Terraform code. And you can try it like this, but some of you may think like, yeah, but we've already saw different bootstrappers which were just, uh, uh, not bootstrap, but boilerplate code which were just straight uh, <coughs> hello world, but it's not actually practical and we just delete it immediately. That's why I've paid lots of attention to <coughs> how to how to write it like to be as close to uh, ready to use as possible. It takes a lot of amount of attention to all details, connections, and uh, actually uh, enforce Terraform best practices by installing and configuring different tools like pre-commit tools, uh, Terraground, and so on. It is open source, and if you uh, like AWS Lambda and Python, you may try to look and open issue there. And uh, yeah, that's it. So there will be some. Uh, <laughs> we still have some time. So. Yeah. Speak loudly. Please don't get up and start moving because uh, that will disturb the question uh, round and we have a little bit of time. So thank you very much for the talk. In all of the time that you spent with Terraform, what, uh, what is your preferred uh, state management and state locking system? I know it's kind of off topic, but. State management, you mean S3? The yeah, and locking. How do you make sure that it's locked? Yeah. So. The question is uh, about state management. I, I hear this question pretty often uh, from uh, not AWS users because uh, Azure doesn't have any blob storage which is usable. Right? No, I mean uh, blob storage. I mean if you and if you say that you don't want to lose this file and then you delete this file, you actually lose it. That's not state management in Azure. So uh, a lot of people are happy uh, with whatever they have easily available. If they already have console installed in their network, in their infrastructure, then they keep using console for the rest of their life. But uh, if it's just new project which started uh, from zero, then S3 will satisfy your needs for a very long time. And I personally have not heard almost anyone who is using something else. I mean, of course, on Google you can use whatever Google provides, but uh, there are no, I have not met anyone who is saying that, oh, we are using just solution infrastructure. So it's console, S3, and that's it. And for locking, sorry, uh, answering question about locking, it's also whatever you have in place. Most of people will never, uh, will never meet any challenges with DynamoDB. It works just fine. All right. Any more questions? One more time. I asked if you could please not start moving because it's really disturbing for everyone who is interested in the question. Uh, well, thanks for the speech. Um, I would like to ask, uh, I don't know if in your, your experience I uh, have seen something like that, but I... I don't uh, sorry. 
Um, I don't know if you have seen in, in your Terraform life uh, something about like changing from current modules that you are using to um, cloud formation stacks. As far as I know, there's no no tool for that right now. I'm, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, so it's really an interesting question because pe once people start using Terraform, they are almost never looking into anything else, right? I mean, there are some competitors, but it's not cloud formation. So even if people are with AWS and they say that we are not going to leave AWS, we are quite happy with uh, cloud formation, it's unlikely that uh, they will suddenly stop using Terraform and continue using cloud formation. There are no tools as far as I know, but uh, there are some quite easy uh, ways how you can do this, since uh, both are pretty well documented. You may have some guess. There are tools like Terraforming to, uh, to, to generate Terraform configuration code based on your existing infrastructure so that you run Terraforming and it will give you uh, HTL snippet uh, for this specific resource which you just copy paste and it will be able to adopt existing resources into Terraform state as well. But there is no need uh, since I have not heard as you mentioned uh, Terraform live Um, I think that um, on this topic, the, where we've seen it is that uh, every once in a while you see these uh, uh, cloud formation stacks that are like fully developed and uh, to convert something like that to Terraform is not always easy. For instance, the AWS landing zone uh, stuff is like a huge cloud formation stack. Uh, yeah, and so I haven't seen a proper Terraform landing zone uh, Answering uh, or adding information about uh, this migration from existing resources is not in interest of AWS to let you go. <laughs> and so they have, they clearly have something internally. What I mean, they pay attention quite clearly what's going on in the market, but it's not something what they're interested in doing. That's why you don't have even access to state. Right? You you cannot do anything with state, so you have to literally kill this resource and start it in another place. In many situations, it's not acceptable. All right, thank you very much. Um, now we can move. <laughs>